Uh, let's go to corporate welfare. You want to compare poverty welfare with corporate? Trillions of dollars we had to spend directly and indirectly to bail out Wall Street. Half of what Washington does is a shoveling out subsidies, handouts, quotas, inflated contracts to corporations. That's what they do in Washington. It's your money. Corporate welfare. The conservatives call it crony capitalism. Same thing. There's a big conservative liberal convergence. If they would organize more than just talk about it, they could change it. It's an unstoppable political force. All right, now we get the regulation. This is fun. You think of government when you think of regulation. That's true. Uh, but a lot of regulation, you know, is lobbied through by corporations to regulate us. Like we have to pay our taxes, but they get away not paying their taxes. And so they, they push through regulations to favor their bottom line, to favor their profits, including corporate welfare. Now here's how corporations regulate us. How many of you have signed fine print contracts in your life? Nobody, nobody has not, right? Okay, it's sign on a dotted line or click on, right? How many of you have ever read these fine print contracts? Once? Okay. You know why most people read, don't read them other than they're microscopic? It's because it, it doesn't matter. If they see things they don't like, too bad. If you don't like State Farm's policy, go to Allstate. No kidding, it's the same fine print. You don't like GM, go to Ford. No kidding, it's the same installment loan fine print. Now, the two great freedoms in our country, which we inherited from medieval England, was freedom of contract, no more serfs with vassals and lords, freedom of contract, and the freedom to sue for wrongful injury. Somebody hurt you, you can sue them. Some company sold you a dangerous product, you could sue them. The corporations, strategically planning our legal system, have now reached a point where they have persuaded too many judges that you have agreed to all this fine print. You have agreed to them saying, if you have a complaint, you can't go to court, you gotta go to compulsory arbitration. Really? You have agreed that the company can change the contract unilaterally without even telling you. Really? That isn't even a contract, right? It's supposed to be a meeting of the minds. How many of you have had to pay for a bounce check? What do you pay in California? 30? 35? Okay. Did you agree to that? Did you agree to all those late penalty charges? Did you agree to all the 350 different charges banks hit you with? Of course not. Oh yes you did, it's in the fine print. That's how they regulate you. That fine print is the way they regulate and shove the responsibilities onto you and escape from responsibility to you by the vendors. That's corporate regulation. Okay, so we grow up corporate, all right? So I don't want you to get embarrassed with this question, but how many of you have never been to McDonald's? That's, that makes you and me. Are you from Finland? Okay, he went in Moscow, but as a tourist. Okay, how many of you have never been to a Walmart? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. How many of you have never been to a Starbucks? Okay, one, two, three. Good, we ought to form a club. <laughs> Why haven't I been to these? So I will not be a patron of these giant corporations who always want to escape their taxes when you've got small family business that can do a good job in the community. That's what I want to support. Besides, 
I didn't want to grow fat on triple cheeseburgers <laughs> slithering down my throat. I don't particularly like Walmart, the way they treat workers. They're paying a million workers less today in inflation adjusted income than Walmart workers were paid in 1968. They would now be paid $11.25 and they finally got up to about 10 bucks now for Walmart. I don't like the way they hollow out small business in Main Street to core the community. I don't like the way they shut down and abandon after they've gotten tax abatements. I don't like the way they have suppliers overseas who pay their workers dirt slave wages. I don't like the way they tell suppliers here if that if they want to sell to Walmart, they better go to China and meet the, what they call the China price. That's for starters. I don't like the idea that the head of Walmart makes $12,000 an hour plus benefits. An hour! Have that sink in. Before martini time lunch on January 2, that man has paid himself more than the entire full-time worker does for the entire year. If we don't have an indignation level, we'll never change anything. I'm not talking about flailing out in rage. I'm talking about connecting what we know in our heads with fire in our belly for change. I never liked bullies since I was four years old. I didn't like sixth graders beating up fourth graders. Sometimes I paid the price and interfering. So here we go. How can Laverne College be a powerful force in democracy? It's so easy, it's embarrassing. What you do is you com connect the school with the community. I'm sure you have already different connections, obviously, volunteers and so on. But here's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> when I took chemistry, biology in high school, we did not test soils in our community. We did not test the local drinking water. Why not? We would have been more interested in chemistry and biology if we tested soils for contamination or if we tested drinking water for toxics. We never did it. So I hardly remember anything I learned in biology and chemistry class. Went through one year after another. I suppose colleges around the country tested local drinking water. You think Flint, Michigan and the lead disaster would have happened? Of course not. They'd have caught it right at the beginning when they switched from the Detroit River to the Flint River without telling the people, and they poisoned all these kids. Soil erosion and soil contamination, very serious problem in this country. A lot of times you go to California farm country and you're on a little road, and when they had lead-based uh, gasoline, tetraethyl lead, you had all the crops right next to it in ingesting that lead. And of course, you know, that's silent violence. You know, lead in your food doesn't sting you, but it's harmful. That's the kind of thing schools can do all over the country. How does Laverne College become powerful in Congress? Easier than you think. You have government classes. You have one called Congress 101. What does Congress 101 do? You study Congress through the lens of the two senators and representatives. You break up the class with all different parts of a senator and member of Congress career. Some do the voting. Some do the behavior at hearings. Some of the students do the campaign contributions. Some of them do constituent service. Some of them do the level of bullshit coming out of their mouths. Okay. Some of them do how they connect with each other. Do they mobilize each other for the right things? Or do they just follow the leader and blindly do what the political leader or the delegation chief of the state tells them to do? How do they connect with the federal agencies? How do they handle letters, and requests from constituents back home? What do they do with their vacations? 
Are they abandoning town meetings with telephone meetings because they don't want the seats full of protesting citizens? It's a lot of fun, isn't it? It's a lot of fun. And you put out a report every year or every semester. You know what happens? You become the most important people in California for those politicians in Washington. Knowledge, building, democratic power. You also learn a lot more about Congress. You also learn how to interview staff and members of Congress, none of whom will say no to you because they know that you are the pipeline of information about how they behave and misbehave to thousands of voters back home. Just an example. So there's a lot harder things you're going to do in life than be an active citizen for two to three, four hundred hours a year on the injustice of your choice, connecting in the neighborhood, the community, state, nation, and the world. What are the harder things you're going to do in life? Try raising children. <laughs> Try caring for an ailing grandparent when you have no home health care. Try overcoming accidents. Try having two jobs at low income and you're paying $1,000 a month daycare and commuting two hours a day. Being an active citizen improves your private life, improves your private livelihood. It gives you bigger meaning. It has, gives you a higher estimate of your own significance. When I came to California years ago and helped start the California Public Interest Research Group, CalPERG, anybody hear of CalPERG? They've done a lot of good things. The students assess themselves, six, seven, eight bucks a year. They have a nonprofit group. They elect a board of directors. They hire activists in their 20s and 30s, lawyers, community advocates, uh, sometimes scientists. And they lobby. They set up initiatives. Uh, they win. And that's the kind of work you should get course credit for. And in some states with these public interest research groups, the faculty do give course credit in places like uh, New York State. Uh, in fact, uh, a young woman went to Albany uh, on semester from SUNY Binghamton, and she lobbied through a hearing aid bill for the elderly who were being ripped off, and she got a semester credit for it. How's that for learning by doing? Marcus Cicero once said, the ancient Roman lawyer, freedom is participation in power. And an 14th century Chinese philosopher put it in another way. He said, to know and not to do is not to know. Look at the tens of thousands of professors all over the country. We're in a crisis now politically. Are they going to mobilize or are they going to stick to their routines? If they stick to their routines, 100,000 faculty have less power than one corporate lobbyist in Washington. If they break out and they become greater than the sum of their parts, a lot of change can come together with the students who work with them. So I've been very gratified, the students who are protesting. The mother of all ascent in our history is dissent. Almost everything we've agreed upon in this country, including free speech and protection against search and seizure illegally and so on, all started out with dissenters, and it became assent. Dissent is the mother of assent. And so that's what it is before you, and always ask yourself, are you doing some, the same thing every weekend or every evening, or are you breaking your routine so that you can have a higher estimate of your own impact as citizens and help change the world for the better. That's what we want to look back on 20,000 days from now. You want to look back and ask yourself, what, what did you miss that you, could, you didn't have to miss? What movement of justice could you have been a part of that would have gave, given you unquantifiable gratification? I want to end on this note. Change is a lot easier than we think. There are 535 members of Congress. They put their shoes on every day like you and I. We know their names. 
They have enormous authority. We leave them alone. We give them the power we have and they turn it against us so often on behalf of a handful of big corporations. We shouldn't leave them alone. We should recover that power and summon them to our town meetings and our agendas and our future and then send them back to Washington with our instructions, especially on issues backed by conservative and liberals alike. Someday, some of you will form these Congress watchdog groups in every congressional district. And someday, there'll be a Nobel Prize for people who are innovative champions in practicing democracy. Thank you very much.